Hey, everybody. Hello. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Yeah. Bonjour. Mm -hmm. Hello. Let us see your smiling faces if you don't put your video on. Oh, if you yeah. Bonjour. Yeah. Hello. Hello. There they come. I see an awful lot of familiar faces. Wow. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Come in, say hello. Hey, he's hello. Where yeah. are you? Tell us oh. where you are. Lancaster, yeah. Pennsylvania. Okay. San Maria, okay. California. Hilton okay. Head Island, South Carolina. Oh, I love Hilton Head. So I go nowhere near the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. And I just moved here from Seattle. So I lost my job and I kind of did instead of going to Paris, I moved to the beach <laughs> in South Carolina. Uh -huh. okay, well, you could be in this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in Seattle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Boy, we have them all over the place. Minneapolis, oh, Minnesota. Oh, that's a so, nice place. <laughs> hello. Uh, so I for you Californians, it's early. I didn't know you put on. James <laughs> Keegan. Mm -hmm. Hi, ladies. Wait a second. Mm -hmm. How can I make more from the I have to say hi. Mm -hmm. I love it. Voilà. Welcome, welcome, hey, here welcome. we are. Welcome to Après Midi. So mm -hmm. it's not Après Midi for many of you, though, right? <laughs> for most of you, it's the morning. It's the matin. <laughs> yeah. It's not Après Midi. It's just an American flag. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Take care. Oh, okay. What you're going to be able to see, though, is how the lighting is going to change because, you know, that it's the sun is starting to go down here in Paris. Oh, just, just, and so you'll probably notice my lighting change over time and until it gets dark, which will be weird for many of you who are just waking up to sunshine. Mm -hmm. um, but it's fantastic that we can do this. And so... So for those of you who have not participated, um, you know, normally après-midi, we hold this at the Café de la Mairie in the third arrondissement at three o'clock in the afternoon on the second Tuesday of the month, like we've been doing since 2003. But because the café is shut tight and we're under confinement, um, we've been having them on Zoom. And thanks to Zoom, we've had, you know, um, we've had times where we've had well over 100 people on um, from all over the, you know, all over the US and even all over the world. And uh, it's opened this event up to a much larger audience, which has really been fantastic. And in fact, I'm not even sure I want to go back to just doing it at the cafe. <laughs> I, know. This, I know because this is, you know, so amazing. <laughs> Um, so what's going to happen here is we are recording it and we will be making this available to everyone to watch. So not just you guys, but, you know, all of our readers. And if you open your chat box, if you know how to do that, you go to the bottom and click on chat. Uh, you'll be able to send questions or messages to either privately to each other or to all of us. Okay, which also gets saved. And on the upper right corner, you know, you can change your view from gallery view to speaker view. So when, after I introduce Rosemary Flannery, who I will introduce very shortly, you can always change to speaker view. And at that time when she's speaking, I'm going to ask that you mute yourselves. We can also mute you just so that there's no conflict so that she'll have the floor. And um, then there will be, after her presentation, there will be a Q and A. And I'd like actually, when you ask your questions to not just put them in chat, you can put them in chat, then we'll call on you and you can unmute yourself so that you can actually ask the question because I like the real interaction, you know, that we really get to kind of feel like we're 
maybe sorta kinda in the same room. <laughs> maybe we can pretend that we are, even though we're all over the world. Um, and so uh, if everybody's in agreement, you wanna get started, I'm gonna introduce Rosemary Flannery, um, who I'm very, very pleased to have as our speaker. Rosemary and I, we couldn't figure out how long we've known each other, but we know it's about somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15 years, 10 or 15 years. Yeah. Uh, Rosemary thinks we might have met at uh, a Paris uh, soiree dinner that was run by Patricia LaPlante Collins many moons ago, but we're not mm -hmm. even sure of that because we participate in so many things together. And um, Rosemary is, you know, she's quite a, uh, an accomplished artist. She's been here since 1989, but she's also, that's just only one of her hats actually, because she's a tour guide on um, architecture and history in Paris. She's also the author of a book called Angels of Paris. Rosemary, do you have a copy of your book handy? I do, and I'll be showing it on the screen. But um, okay, I, okay, then I'll let I'll let you do that. But it's a beautiful book about the angels of Paris, and I had no idea. Thanks to Rosemary, I learned that there's an angel on my corner that I had <laughs> never noticed. Okay, until Rosemary pointed it out. I mean, on my corner for 23 years that I've been living here. It, you know, never even noticed it. So it was like an awakening. How sweet that is. Uh, and the book has also been printed in French. So it's in English and in French, but I'll let her talk about that. Um, Rosemary recently did a wonderful thing for me. She did a, I don't know if you all have seen this, but uh oh, how could, can you see that? Nice. Mm -hmm. Rosemary yeah. did a portrait of me that she took from a photo. I think she did a hell of a good job. <laughs> I think it's really beautiful. And um, I just need to get it framed and up on the wall, which I will do very soon. And uh, so I think it's, I think I've said enough, don't you? It's time. I think you have people so, waiting to come in. Um, Phyllis Mazzocchi, or can I admit people if I see well, it? Well, Patty, Patty, yeah, or Patty, I'll do it, or Patty will do it. Don't okay, worry, fine. we'll make sure everybody gets in. All right. Um, okay, so on that okay. note, Let's uh, let's give Rosemary the floor. Give her an applause. Thank you, Rosemary. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, it's all yours. All right. Uh, so what I'm going to first of all, thank you very much, Adrian, for having me today. Uh, it's really a pleasure. Um, and uh, Adrian had said to me, "Why don't you tell you know the story about all the various things you've done and and." Uh, you know, weave them together and so on. And it's true, I've been in Paris over 30 years now and, and I have done a lot of things, but my artistic training started a bit in New Jersey and then in New York and so on. And so finally I thought uh, I'm going to tell my artistic journey through my life. <laughs> so it's my life artistic story. And uh, I put together a PowerPoint presentation. So there are slides and in this way, things are punctuated with the various works I was doing. And, and, uh, and so that's what I'd like to share with you. So I'm going to share the screen now. Okay, uh, so here we are today. Okay, and everybody don't forget to mute yourselves, okay? I'm gonna do the same. All right, and I'm just moving everybody over. Uh, well, oopa, I went too fast, voila. So um, this is a picture you would have seen on the invitation, and this is where I am right now. And it's my studio in Paris. And uh, it used to be a guest room. And the funny thing is that over a year ago, when I even really didn't have any time for painting, now maybe two years ago, I thought, you know what? I know I'm gonna get back to my art at some point, and I'm just gonna turn that guest room into my studio. I'm, I'm gonna get rid of the sofa bed and set up my easel, put all my art supplies, all my art library, all of this stuff in there. And I did, and then when COVID happened, I was like, well, I'm all set, you know? But anyway, uh, so here I am and uh, with my easel and my mall stick, which is what you use when you're drawing to get to the fine details. And um, I came here, as, as I said, oh, well, now that makes 32 years ago. I was born in Bergenfield, New Jersey. And uh, 
uh, I always wanted to be an artist. <laughs> and funnily enough, I saved this book. I've had this for years, as you can see. I must have bought it when I was about, I don't know, 12 years old, when I was had babysitting money. It was just a dollar. Portraits and how to do them. So you can teach yourself a lot of things, by the way, from books. But I was always drawing my brothers and sisters and pictures from newspapers and so on. And uh, I can't actually find any of my early work, except for this, it's not that early, and I'm sorry, it's not a very good photo, but this is in New Jersey, and it's my brother Billy, uh, my youngest brother. And uh, this, is a, this is around 1994 when I went back um, to visit one summer, and he was just, we were chatting, and then he was sitting on the curb, and I, I took the photo, and I did this kind of unusual uh, portrait on a wood panel. It's just a sepia tone, but it's in oil. Um, so. I'm going to eventually, although I really want to be an artist, uh, my middle class parents thwarted this slightly by saying, oh, no, 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 you know, you have to get a job, we have insurance and so on. And I really did love clothes and fashion. So I thought, well, I'll go to fashion design school. Why not? You know, and I, I went to a school called Traphagen. It closed a few years ago, but it was a very nice school. But I really didn't want to do that. So after six months, I left because I knew what I really wanted to do was draw. And I didn't think I had the talent to create a collection, although I love getting dressed up. It's another thing to design a collection. So I went to, um, I had all these dreams of coming to France, but first of all, I spent about a year at Hunter College. I went to Hunter College and I was able there to learn French and you know study history and literature and so on. All the while I was dreaming about this French plan I had, right? So I just threw this up because I thought, you know, we all have our reasons for coming to France and many of them are the same. It's the food, the wine. This one actually has a little palette. So the art, uh, the, the wine, the monuments and so on, the croissant. And for me also, it was a lot about the culture. I, I loved uh, reading. I still love reading, but I was reading um, at all. Guy de Maupassant, and, and it's, it's actually mine is, I had to move this bit, but you have Victor Hugo, Les Miserables. This had an immense effect on me. I just had to walk down those cobblestone streets and meet people named Cosette. You know, I, I, this, I, I had to do this. And I was also reading the Russians, and this, this was amazing to me. Tolstoy, in the 19th century, the Russians were speaking French. And I thought, well, this is really funny. I'm reading these Penguin editions, but I have to understand French in order to read this, even though you know it was translated to English. They didn't always translate the French parts. So all roads led to Paris. And uh, finally, what I'm going to end up doing is, uh, I, oh, well, I do. I, sorry, I go to Paris. I, I live in Paris for about a year. I work here for about a year. In a way, you know, you're not really allowed to come for a whole year. You're supposed to leave every three months. But anyway, I was here. And of course, I went to all the museums. And one thing that amazed and thrilled me about France and Paris in particular was the idea that so many artists came here from so many different countries. And they came, it was, it was a magnet to them, I think, culturally. But then they really lived and worked. And they, all di and they died here as well. I mean, their lives, the bulk of their lives just been here. So, uh, Medigliani from Liverno in Italy, and uh, of course Van Gogh. This is a scene he did of Montmartre. He came from Holland, um, and uh, Picasso from Spain, and uh, then you know <laughs> Rosemary from New Jersey. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, after going back to um, New York, I decided, okay, what I have to do is really finish school, and if I'm going to have to work it during the day, which I did, I had to put myself through school. I may as well see if I could get into the best school in New York, which was Columbia. And luckily I, I did. And I was working at the movie channel at the time. That's why I put this up. And uh, then I was working for Chanel and that was a great job. I traveled a bit and we launched um, the men's fragrance Anteos. So that's why this is here. All the while I'm hoping I'm gonna get transferred to France. And then uh, finally I get my degree and I start working for the major fashion houses. And Yves Saint Laurent was alive at the time. I worked for him in New York and then Guy Laroche, very lovely man, and then Louis Ferro. But all during this time, if I wasn't traveling, I'd go to the Art Students League. And that's this wonderful school you see in the upper right-hand corner. And I'd take drawing lessons on the weekend uh, or, you know, they'd have live models. So you, you could draw, you would just sign up and, and go in there. They weren't necessarily lessons per se, it, evenings as well. So this was always in the back of my mind, you know, that. This is what I want to do. Although I was lucky, I had creative jobs, especially Guy Laroche. I was 
I was working on their publicity, designing the advertising, um, you know, Louis Ferro as well. Uh, so I was, I was using my artistic skills nonetheless. Uh, so anyway, without getting transferred to Paris. So I was saying my whole idea is, oh, I'll get muté, as they say in France, I'll get transferred. Well, long story short, I meet my future ex-husband in New York. And this is my real transfer to Paris. I get married and I come to France. And uh, I love that future ex-husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my husband, right. Uh, I, I used to say um, my misbegotten marriage. It, it was, but still, last many years, and I have to say, you can see he's uh, he's Tunisian, actually. He's Tunisian French, very macho guy. And Gilles said, oh, Cherie, I do not want my wife to work, you know? I was like, well, this is news to me, you know? I mean, this is a new life. I was working all my life, babysitting part-time jobs, putting myself to school. He said, you can do whatever you want. I thought, okay, great, I'm going to paint, you know? So I went to the Louvre, I started making copies at the Louvre. And when I was there, I met uh, a man named um, uh, Mar Marino Barbiero. And Marino had a, a, an atelier where he was teaching and um, he was a real radical. And he felt all painting ended after the 18th century. I'm not making this up, that's what he believed. And so all we did were copies of the masters. And we did some live, life drawing as well, we, we copied drawings. And so this is a painting, this is my, well, these are two of my first copies. Um, it, this is Titian, um, a portrait of a man and a still life by Chardin. And uh, I, I, I love these paintings, they're really dear to my heart because I learned so much about these artists and I love art history, so I would read about their lives and so on. But, you know, you really learn about structure and composition in copying the masters, the color as well shadow, you know, you, you know, when you look at these, look for instance at, at, at Chardin, all the colors in the background, how rich it is. There's just, there's so much there. And, and with Titian, the psychological content in his portraits, I, I just, I, you know, I found it phenomenal. So I worked with Marino, uh, I worked in that studio for a while. And uh, I also went, took some classes at the Beaux-Arts. You could go in the summer or at night, normally you have to be under 25, I was over 25 but they had these other things that you could participate in. And, and so that, that, was, that was excellent as well. Um, and then on my own, I did copies. I did Fragonard. I love Fragonard. This painting is of a, a little boy just in this costume that's too big for him with a hat and he's holding these posies. And um, in some ways it's had an influence on me because I like also doing portraits of kids that are, are kind of casual, you know? I mean, I do all different types of portraits, but, but I love this sort of thing that's, almost a little bit awkward, you know what I mean? But it, it really seizes the personality. Um, so, I don't, uh, so yeah, that's what I tried to do in this picture. It's on my website. This is a girl, she's in her nightgown. And, uh, you know, I was at the parents' home and I took the picture and I said, well, th this is the portrait, you know, this is great. She's wearing a nightgown, she's eating a cookie. She has all these like kind of ballet slipper. Uh, and uh, I, I did this, it's mostly pastel. It's really just done with a few colors, but it was definitely, um, I had Fragonard on my mind, that's for sure. Uh, oh, so then, um, sorry, I have to go back for a second. Um, I mentioned uh, my, my ex-husband, Tunisian French, so I went to Tunisia a lot. And uh, this is Zina. This is a portrait I did there, Zina was the bun, and that means like the, the housekeeper. And she was with the family for like 30 years. She was kind of grouchy, um, sorry, uh, but she was great. I mean, she has she, such a personality. She's a real character. And uh, I, I included her painting in my exhibition. I just want to go back to her because she, <laughs> you can see she's a little stern looking, but she did agree to hold these red hibiscus and let me put one in her hair. She looks and, pretty grumpy there, Rosemary. She does look really grumpy. <laughs> yeah, she was. She was grumpy, but you know, she was amazing. Sometimes she'd bring things into the house for me to paint. So yeah, she was. She was. She had a hard personality. But so here's the thing. Um, my uh, my father-in-law goes to the exhibition, and you know, I had a lot of stuff on the wall. He bought this painting, and I said, you know. I called him my beau papa, my, my beau père was beau papa. I said, I thought you didn't, um, I thought you didn't like Sina. He said, but she is Tunisia. <laughs> I, I understood what he meant in a way, you know, um, but and not that Tunisia's a grumpy, no, it wasn't that, but, but yeah, the painting was, 
it's, it's so, I put Sidi Bou Said in the background. Um, and I was so I did, that was my first exhibition, exhibition, and it was a solo expo. And this is a wonderful place called the Collège des Irlandais. It's the, uh, literally means the College of the Irish. And in the Middle Ages, each different group would come from uh, around the world to study at the Sorbonne, which was the real international center of learning in the 13th century in particular. I mean, it still is very important, obviously, but they would set up these kind of houses uh, that were kind of elegant dormitories, if you like, and all of the students from a particular country would stay in them. And um, my name is Flannery, you know, obviously I have Irish background, and I was very fortunate they, they allowed me to, to do an exhibition there. And by the way, this painting is a, a, a little girl that I met in Tunisia. She's Tunisian and, uh, and Russian. And she was a ballerina. She was really just wearing a, a sleeveless t-shirt, but I put this collarette around her because I thought it, it gave you the idea of her, um, you know, what her love was. And, and she was quite amazing because as she did so much sport and, and, and dance, she posed almost on blinking for an hour. I mean, you know, and then she'd just take a short break and pose for me again. And it's very rare for people to have that stamina. And it's for this reason that generally I have to work on photo. Nobody really has the time or, or the patience to pose. So while I'm at the um, college, one of the first portrait commissions I got was from this Irish priest, Father Knowles. Um, I was kind of surprised a priest would as for his portrait, but he did. And so there he is in his quarters. And uh, this is a, a commission also that I got from that period. Um, so about portraits, uh, I do oils as well. And sometimes it's nice to have people in their setting like Father Knowles on the left, but Veronique on the right, um, you know, she's very striking. Excuse me? I hear somebody else talking. Oh, sorry. What? Maybe, I don't know what that was, just a little interference perhaps. So, uh, yeah, and it's also nice when people wear clothes that have some pictorial interest, like you see Veronique is wearing this interesting um, zip top uh, blouse and, and she has this ravenous hair. So um, all these things are kind of a delight, you know, to an artist because it's a challenge, but it's, it's, it's a thrill at the same time. So, um, so I'm still married at this point, and my husband uh, was a bit of a spendthrift, and he wanted to go away every weekend to all of these, you know, rather fancy places. And it was nice, but, but when you're an artist, you want to also go to one place or, or have some place to go to. And I said, well, why don't we just get a place in the country if you want to leave Paris all the time? And he said, okay, fine. If you find something, you know, we'll do that. And uh, I, I love Burgundy because when I had worked for Chanel, we had done a, a, a shoot there when we were doing the filming for Antaeus. And by chance, there was an ad in uh, this new this kind of journal. It still exists now. It's mostly online. France, USA contacts. And believe it or not, there was an apartment for rent in a chateau. And uh, so we go there and, um, and we get the apartment. And uh, this is the chateau. So I have two pictures of it and I'll explain why in a minute. But I did this ink drawing and the apartment we had was in this part. This is the Renaissance part of the chateau. And then this part was added on in the 17th century. And my kitchen was in the tower. <laughs> it was really fun. I had a round what kitchen. What was the name of the chateau, Rosemary? What was the name? Uh, it's called the Chateau d'Ilande. And Ilande is spelled like island, I-S-L-A-N-D. And you'll see that spelled out in a minute because I did drawing. Uh, at one point, I, I go on to do drawing lessons here. But I'm, I'm sorry, on the right, I, I'm sorry, but when I scanned it, it cut off a little bit of the bottom part. But what happened was, um, I do this, it was a bigger picture and uh, uh, the chateau owner, the chate Chatelaine, she really loved it. And one of her kids, uh, well, he was a young man, Richard, Richard, he was getting married. And Richard and Alina, they said, oh, that's great. You know what, we'd like to use that, not as our wedding invitation, but as a card we could put at each seat um, for the sit down dinner. And could you do something for us? I said, yeah, sure. So in fact, where you see the road winding around, well, at the bottom I had written in curved letters, Richard Al Aline. And then inside, I don't, sorry, here's the menu. <laughs> so you see, uh, Marc Menot, by the way, he's a great French chef. He, he just died uh, recently. He had a, a fine restaurant called L'Esperance. And here's the menu. I, I spelled foie gras wrong. <laughs> you can see I was only in France, well, I was in France a few years, but foie, it's F O. 
I E. But anyway, uh, there you go. It was this. It was uh, I looked at this today. I thought, well, that was some good menu, wasn't it? It was this fancy asparagus with foie gras and warm toast and uh, a fancy sort of chicken with uh, tiny shrimp. Anyway, sounds so, delicious. It, yeah, really, <laughs> honestly, and you see the wine list on the left. So we were living near Vézelay, and Vézelay um, is, um, is wine country, but it's very famous for uh, a basilica, a basilica of, the, 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 of Marie Magdalene. Many people go there uh, as tourists to see it. And you see we had a Medoc wine and so on. Um, it's really, it was really fine and champagne at the end with the dessert, very, very French. Um, so here you go, 1996. And uh, I did a lot of painting there, of course. And um, this was a, a lovely young girl. Uh, it was a commission I had. And um, her family, her parents owned a restaurant. And the view from the restaurant was of these fields that were vineyards. So I put that in the background. And then this was a view from our chateau apartment. These are other buildings on the grounds. And it was really idyllic. And, and then you have portraits of cows. Um, Cows are very soulful animals. They really are very, very beautiful. So um, I painted the cows. I painted donkeys as well. I did all the animals. And then for some reason, tout d'un coup, as we say in French, all of a sudden, even though I didn't need to work, in um, 1997, I thought, you know what? I, th I think I'd like to do something to earn money. I don't know what. There's nothing really to do out there in the country. There's a lot of, there, there, there was low unemployment. So I thought, well, I'll have to invent something. So why don't I give drawing lessons? And I don't drive, uh, but I had a bicycle and I made these posters and it says Cours de Dessin. So that means uh, drawing courses. This is a portrait I did. Um, the portrait I did in 1994, but the class is 1997. And uh, it was three months long, April, May, June. I was meant to do it at the Chateau de Londres. Although I have to say my husband had a very volatile personality, let's just put it that way. He had a falling out with the chateau owner. I was supposed to give the classes there. Then she said, no, I couldn't because she was mad at my husband. So I had to give it at the mayor's, um, the mayor's office. They're, they're in, in a, oh gosh, I meant to put up the picture of that because as a gift uh, for them lending me the space, you know, when you go to the French villages, the mayor's office often is also the schoolhouse. So the classrooms are attached to the mayor's office because they have a population of maybe 250 and uh, even, even less. And so there aren't that many kids. And anyway, that's how it is. So I gave these courses and I have Nature Morte, that's still life, paysage, landscape, and portrait, portrait. It was pretty ambitious really, but in three months, I had never done this before. So I thought, well, you know, I really want them to learn how to draw these things. It was two hours per week. That's what this is, deux heures par semaine. And uh, here afterwards I wrote, you know, the price, it wasn't that expensive. So I got six students right away. And then because we did a lot of drawing out of doors and, and the, the people loved it. I mean, they really did enjoy it. They'd say, oh, my cousin's in town or, or you know, could my friends come and this and that. So sometimes I have 12 people, sometimes I have 20 people, you know, it would be out of doors. So it worked Where out did you end up holding them? If the chateau wasn't gonna let you, where, where did you end up holding the courses? That's why I just said, I, I, I had it in the mayor's office Oh, but right, in the mayor's office, okay. In the schoolhouse of the mayor's office. Yeah, maybe later, if I if I flip through myself, I'll, I'll find the painting I did for them of the, the village mairie, mayor's office slash schoolhouse. That's where I taught. Um, so it worked out, but but when I was going to do it, I thought it would be in the chateau and, and, and that didn't happen, but it all worked out. And uh, so I actually, uh, because I am thinking of giving workshops and maybe teaching online, I, I looked in my files and I still have some examples of the, my students' work. And uh, these are very simple exercises, but although they look simple, they're actually hard if, if you're a debutante, if you're just beginning. So on the left, this is what we call a tembal in French. So it's a, a metal cup. And I wanted them to draw from different angles. And then I would go around and correct it because there's a certain amount of perspective even when you're drawing a cup. This was the one on the right. This was actually our first lesson. And this is about um, volume and proportion so that you think about the sizes and how high this is in proportion to this. And I basically just took, you know, cereal boxes and painted them white or, you know, cans, painted them white, painted everything white and put a background 
So they had some shadows, but it would pop out. And that's what we did. And then I, I taught them to also look at shapes. And, and one way is that you make a drawing of it, but then you paint the outside with gouache, with a water-based paint. And it, it's a nice way to, to learn, to train your eye. And then on the right, um, portraiture. This is actually taken from, I had them copy a drawing from Da Vinci and uh, it's on graph paper, it's on line paper. Uh, we call it a whole little squares because it, it helps to see the proportions that way. And um, the thing about drawing a face is, well, it's so fascinating on many levels, but um, you know, our eyes are separated by one eye, you know, and the ears depends, but some ears go, the top goes as high as the eyebrow and then as low as the nose. Some don't, some ears will start at this level. Um, Buddha's ears, for instance, go very long. That's supposed to be a sign of wisdom. And then the mouth generally ends midway through the eye. Now this is the, port, the profile, so you don't see it as well, but, but, but there you go. So um, let me see what I, oh, so then um, what happens is, uh, my marriage actually sort of disintegrates when I'm in Burgundy and uh, I'm back up in Paris and I'm staying at a friend's house in the seventh, actually it was a townhouse. And her, her husband was, uh, they, were, they were South African and they, they um, he had contacts uh, with the government and uh, with Nelson Mandela. And uh, this is a very beautiful woman, Lani. Um, she came to Paris with her husband and uh, he was with the government and they were decided they wanted to uh, have her portrait done. And so I did a portrait. Um, this is, the setting was quite nice in the restaurant in Paris. And uh, I, I really tried to, to capture her. She, she wanted this pose, which is a little unusual looking away. But um, by the way, the, the, if I could just tell a little anecdote about the love story, which is quite interesting. You know, Mandela was in prison for 27 years. And um, uh, some people had wives or sweethearts on the outside and some didn't. And there was this one fellow, this one man who eventually becomes her husband. Um, one year they're selling, sending out Valentine's cards and um, he didn't have anyone set, to send to, but he was in love with somebody he'd seen on television. And it was this woman. And he decides to send her Valentine's card, but not sign it. He was too shy. She gets this Valentine's card and she was so intrigued. She got a Valentine's card from the prison. And she knew that somewhere on the envelope or on the card, they had to put their, their number, their prison number. And she very carefully undid the entire envelope and she found his number and she wrote back to him. And then when he was released, they met and they got married. So um, I, I just thought that was the most wonderful story. Uh, seriously, so, seriously she, he sent a Valentine's card and yes. she figured out, who, she found out who it was and they ended up marrying. That's when correct. He was released. That's, That's a great story. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's it's absolutely story. true. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it was, it was amazing. Um, but also how shy he was, you know, but uh, she had been giving some sort of television. Um, she was co-hosting a show about African culture and uh, and he saw her, you know, and, and you see she's lovely. He fell in love with her, and the rest is history. You know, as they say, I met her children. They came with their kids and everything. It was wonderful. So um, anyway, uh, so then I also started getting other commissions in Paris. I'm sorry, this photo is a little blurry. I, but it, it's a friend. Um, he's German actually. His name is Bernd, but he he and his wife had adopted two children and this one is Mexican and Kim um, was her punk stage. <laughs> she was uh, barely 16. You see, she has an electric guitar. She wanted to be, she wanted to be painted with her guitar. So that's what I did. And then um, I, I put the close up of it because I, I think she really has a beautiful face, but you see she had dreadlocks and everything and, and the pierced, uh, the piercing to her, her, her lip. Uh, since then she's gone into a career in, um, the culinary business. She always loved to cook, so she didn't, in fact, pursue the music career. And now we know who this is, right? <laughs> so while well, I'm back in Paris, um, I, I have this dream, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to give lectures on art history. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But uh, in fact, I fell into the touring business. And it was kind of interesting because touring actually is, um, 
you have to you, you really have to learn a lot about history and art in order to discuss it and uh, at the same time well I'm, I'm going a little bit in advance here but um, here you see here's me in front of Shakespeare and Co I would give tours also of the left bank the Latin Quarter here this is Montmartre in the background you see what we call the wall of love it says it, it's written uh, it says, I love you in about 300 different languages. You see some of them in back of me. And then uh, here I am at the Place Saint-Michel and here's Adrian. And so here's Adrian and she's in front of in the- the rain. <laughs> yeah. In the rain. Yeah, and as she mentioned before the call, I was wearing red and black and she's wearing black and red. Black and red. Just such a funny coincidence, the, the reverse colors. We were so well coordinated, Rosemary, by, <laughs> <laughs> by completely by accident. Yeah. Um, so, you know, all this walking around Paris, um, I got this and loving the architect. Oh, oh, sorry, this I'm going a little bit ahead, but I was still drawing while I was touring. And then I was very fortunate. I uh, was represented by a portrait gallery. So here's the contract. Um, I had signed it in the year 2000. It was called the Gallery de Saint-Père. And I was represented for my drawings. This particular gallery, which no longer exists, unfortunately, she closed after a few years. She decided to retire and go to the south of France. But you can see here she was uh, Madame Farnier, uh, Rue de Saint-Père in the sixth arrondissement. And um, she represented various artists, only portraits. She had a stable, so to speak, of portrait artists, one who did a couple of maybe who did oils, one who did sculptures, one who did mosaic, one who did frescoes, and I was the one for the drawings. And uh, so that was, um, that was great. And I, I, I got a lot of work that way. And one of the things that I got was there was, um, there, she had my portfolio there, plus a couple pieces of my work on the wall. And one of them was of a man and I had drawn him, he had white hair. And uh, so I decided to color in the background with a pastel shade. And so it happened a couple of lawyers go by the gallery and they see this and they said, oh yeah, you know what we should do is have a series of portraits to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Bar Association. And this is the uh, courthouse, the Palais de Justice and Créteil. And so I got these commissions. There was about a dozen portraits all at once that I had to do, it was, it was amazing. And they had a special gala soiree and they sent all the portraits up when you went into the room on either side, you see the framed portraits are lined up. So for now, that makes about 20 years. I was doing all these, uh, every two years, they would change uh, what they call a bâtonnier du barreau de val de Marne, the head of the bar association. And uh, so every two years I would do the new portrait and I was always doing the same technique as they wanted. So here's one that I had done a few years ago of a woman and uh, this pastel background. And so this is Sanguine, by the way, this is what we, Sanguine is red chalk with white highlights and a pastel background. But I will say after 20 years, I thought I'd like to maybe change my style. And in fact, I was inspired by uh, Fragonard and I decided I wanted to do something different, which was in three colors, but, oh, sorry, in Watteau. So Watteau is one of the great 18th century French painters and in the 18th century France was really how should I say like the avant-garde for art and and for drawing and um, there were these there was Boucher, Fragonard, Watteau and in particular Watteau he developed a style called les trois crayons three crayons or three pencils so that means the dark color so that's what we call pierre noir literally means black stone it's like Charcoal, but it's better. It's, it's a little richer, it's a little deeper, and it's a little more tender, and it doesn't smudge as much. And then the sanguine, of course, is the rusty color here. And then it's hard to see here, but there are white highlights. And then he did a lot of also these lovely studies of heads of women and, and so on. So um, I wrote to the, this woman, um, Madame Pascal Vignier, and I said, look, I'm, I'd like to do your portrait uh, in a slightly different way, 18th century style. She said, sure, whatever you like, you know. So here's what I did. And um, you see it's a real departure from the other ones. Uh, and it's the three crayon, the three uh, pencil technique, which by the way, I used in the portrait of uh, Adrian as well. And she, she was very pleased. Um, here's also, this is just a Songhean portrait. 
I, I liked showing this one because I, I don't think I put it on my website, but it was um, it's done in Songin. Uh, but this very point, beautiful. Rosemary. Thank it's you. Very, it's very beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, but you know what's interesting about right. his pose also. So this her name is Sarah, and Sarah posed for me, but she just she I did a few pictures of her, but when she turned her head, I thought, oh, you know, that's really lovely. So it's not a typical full face mm -hmm. one. You see what I mean? Yeah. It's not exactly a profile either, but I think it captures a certain expression. Hello. Mm -hmm. um, so the portrait gallery closes. <laughs> uh, I was very sad about that because it's getting a lot of work through the portrait gallery. Um, is the Excuse me. Down the middle, according to this, 32% say royalty is not. Yeah, so would you guys speak in? Please mute yourself so everyone's not muted. Deborah Bar Barrowdale-Cox, please mute. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rosemary, take the lead. Okay, so, um, so that, uh, that wonderful experience of the gallery lasts about five years, I guess, and she closes. Um, and, uh, but then uh, I was always drawing, of course, and this is a little park near me. It's called the Square, uh, Louis says, the, the, the little garden of Louis the 16th. And um, so when I'm doing, for some reason, when I'm doing this kind of work with ink and, and um, watercolor, uh, it's a totally different style. It's very loose, it's very whimsical and so on. And um, I, at that time, I, I like, I still do like sending cards, but I couldn't find cards of Paris that I really liked that captured my Paris, you know? So my Paris is this elegant, amazing city, but there's something also kind of funny and whimsical about Paris and amazing, you know? <laughs> so I, I love the lampposts and, and this funny way they have of doing parks with park benches and they have these, these really low gates, you know, you kind of wonder what, why, but anyway, there they are. And then the red awnings and so on and the balconies and the scrolly work on their, um, the support system for the balconies and the shutters that are open. I mean, I just love it all. So I made this drawing and then I, I made my own cards and I'd send them to friends. And they said, oh, you know, that, that's really great. You know, and I actually got a commission for painting from that. And then I thought, you know, well, maybe I'll do other scenes of Paris and maybe I'll do cards. So I did these, and these are actually meant to be rough sketches. But, oh, by the way, I also taught, um, I taught painting here in Paris. So I brought in the rough sketches to show one of, the, well, the student where I was doing the classes, she had this really big home. I said, what do you think? You know, I was thinking doing, she said, well, no, no, just use the sketches. I said, oh no, but they're kind of sloppy. They're very loose. She said, no, no, this is fine. I said, really? So I thought, okay, why not? So there you go. You have the Eiffel Tower, the uh, Arc de Triomphe here. And uh, this is the Seine, which I adore um, on the right. And uh, I have these scenes also on my, uh, and more on my, um, my website. I did the Eiffel Tower, you know, Montmartre, the Moulin Rouge, and so on. I did that for about three years. And uh, I was kind of a mom and pop business all by myself, doing, having them printed off, folding them, packing them with envelopes, doing the billing, delivering them. And I had quite a nice um, client list. You know, I was at the Creon Hotel. I was at the Brentano's bookstore, W. H. Smith, all these places. But, you know, the thing is, after three years, I thought, well, should I carry on or not? And I bought that book, <laughs> Entrepreneurship for Dummies. And it said, look, if your, your base price for your product should be $50, otherwise you're never really gonna make money on it. And it wasn't, you know, cards, cards don't cost $50. So um, I thought, okay, you know, I'll, I'll do something else. But um, it was a wonderful uh, experience. I still actually have people asking me sometimes for cards. I have a small stock left. So, um, so then what? Oh yeah, um, then uh, I, I wanna do a series of, of the fountains of Paris. This is a, the Fountain in the Ninth. Um, I have this on my website, but I'll I'll be doing more of that. And then uh, little projects would come my way. So this project is not yet achieved. It hasn't been finished. But I have a friend from Columbia who's now uh, teaching at a school in a university in Mississippi, I believe. And uh, he wrote this adorable children's book. And then Every now and then, we ran into each other on the street, weirdly enough, in Paris. And then uh, one thing leads to, leads to another. He shows me, I said, oh, well, you know, it's great. And I started doing sketches for it. So the story is this young girl comes to Paris. And, you know, most people love Paris, but she didn't. Some people hate Paris. She hated it because 
she had to come because her father was transferred here. She's really unhappy. Um, and uh, she, all she dreams about is going back to, to New York. And her mother takes her one day to uh, the marionette theater, the puppet theater in Luxembourg Gardens. And there's this show going on and, and there's Pierrot who gets kind of clobbered by the other two po puppets. And afterwards, she, she lives in a little bit of fancy line. She knocks on the door of the, the puppet theater. She says, you know, Pierrot, I know how you feel. And I'm sorry, you know, but like, uh, whatever, I really love you or whatever. And then he comes at night. Uh, he, of course, this is all magical realism. And he knocks on her window. And here she, she's lighting a candle because she'd heard, if you light a candle, make a wish, it will come true. And her wish was to go back to New York. So I made this sketch and I know somebody who's in the children's book business and I, I showed it to her and she goes, oh, no, 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 Rosemary, that's all wrong. The colors are too subtle. You have to do something with, you know, stronger colors. I said, okay, it's just a study. But I turned the picture over, I page over and I did it like this. I actually personally like the other one better, but anyway, um, maybe the girl should be older, maybe she'd be younger, you know, all these choices you have to make. But here she is, she's lighting a candle. And uh, lo and behold- I go back. I like the first one too. Yeah, thank you. So, but I started using ink and watercolor. And so what happens is I, I had to actually do this picture. I scanned it in two parts because it's a really big piece of paper. It wouldn't fit into my scanner. But here she is flying through the air with Pierrot. Pierrot says, he comes and says, no, you know, Molly, don't be sad. Paris is a wonderful place. I'm going to show you how great it is. So it's nighttime. You see some golden stars in the sky, the sky is not that dark. Okay, let's pretend it's a summer sky. But anyway, um, they go flying through the air and uh, he says, I'm gonna introduce you to my friends. And so here's the, in French we say, le roi du ciel, the, the, ki the king of the skies. And he's this majestic bird. He's got this fantastic crown on, he's very exotic. And he's, he's got a little um, force, if you like, how would you say his guardians? There they are on that upper level of the Eiffel Tower. They're watching over him. Oh, these happy birds are flying around, you know. And he's welcoming, oh, hello, welcome, you know, Pierrot and, and Molly. And uh, so they're flying. And then, and then, uh, then uh, Pierrot is going to say, and now I want you to meet, uh, of course, this is all fiction. <laughs> You're going to, we're going to go down into the Seine and meet the, La Reine de la Seine, the Queen of the Seine. And here she is. She's this beautiful fish. She's wearing a coral necklace. I had so much fun doing this. <laughs> you see her crown is full of coquillage, full of shells. And what is she doing? She is scolding the fish. Because what they did was uh, she felt they were not welcoming to an eel who had come into the Seine. And you know, eels are kind of ugly. And she's saying now, this is really wrong. You know, you, you should be nicer to that eel. And you see, they're looking a little ashamed. That's, I wanted them to look embarrassed. You see these little seahorses here. They're feeling kind of bashful. There, there's even, um, what do you call the Etoile de Mer? Uh, I forget the word now, but anyway, you, you know, all these fishes that don't starfish. really be, uh, Thank you, starfish, right. So all these fish, they're there. And uh, a little bit of algae as well. And they say, no, 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 that's not true. Um, he doesn't like us. You know, no, we, we, we would welcome him. He's very standoffish. So you see, the moral of the story is that's why Molly wasn't making friends in school because she was too standoffish. She wasn't making any attempt. So the children's story is, you know, to teach her something. And, uh, and luckily, of course, there's a happy ending at the end. Uh, she's going to um, go back to school and make friends and and Pierrot, of course, has taught her how to love Paris. So anyway, so I also, of course, want to mention I, I do watercolors as well. Um, but, uh, and I hope to finish this children's book when, this year, for sure, this year, I'll finish it. Uh, and I wanted to show, you know, I love the master. So of course, I was, yeah, I was influenced by Botticelli. Botticelli here is uh, the birth of Venus, Venus on the half shell. Uh, some people call it. And so that's why I have, you see, I, I really, I, I lifted that from my friend Botticelli. And, and there you go. And I love the color schemes that Botticelli used. Uh, it, this is not a good picture. I mean, I just took it with my, my phone um, uh, from my book. Uh, and, but I like the way he would use orange next to red and pink. And then he, his whites are kind of a gray color. You know, they're, they're very subtle or they, they can be pearly. 
and then I'll use yellow next to, to blue and gray and so on. So I did a still life, um, kind of my homage to, and, and I call it my Botticelli still life. It, okay, it doesn't look anything like a Botticelli painting, but what you do have is you've got the pink next to the orange, and then the walnuts use these brown tones. And he also liked to do, in other painting, you'll see lemon yellow next to a, a real rich red, and uh, then pinks, of course, of course. So, so that's um, at some point I'll, I'll post my still lifes on my website as well. Is your Botticelli watercolor? No, that's an oil. That's an no, oil. Not one. that. Not that one. The the on the shell, on the half shell, that one. That is a watercolor. Yes. Totally, all watercolor. Uh, well, it's also got some black ink and uh, it's got some touches of gold gouache. You see the gold here? We. Oui. Yeah, you, you can't get that with watercolor. You, you have to get a, a gouache, gouache. I, forget, I think you call that same thing in English, but anyway, it's a water-based, um, you know, it's just a gold paint basically. Um, and I brush that on. And then this is the black ink that I would use, yeah. but okay. it's mostly watercolor, yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah, what is Charlie? What is Charlie? Uh, and then I had the idea for my book, and uh, the Angels of Paris because um, I love the architecture of Paris, and um, I was stunned. I was really amazed by all these angels I would find all over the city, and I was really stunned by the fact that nobody else had written the book. It seemed so obvious to me. <laughs> so it's called. Um, the Angels of Paris, an architectural tour through the history of Paris. And inside, <clears throat> there are over 70 angels that I photographed and I researched. And uh, they're in every district. We have 20 arrondissements all together. And I, I tell the story of these angels, who sculpted them and why, why they were commissioned, what they're actually doing in those particular places. So it came out in 2012. And then in 2015, I, I, I got a French editor. And uh, so it's called Les Anges de Paris, a voyage um, architectural au, au coeur de Paris. So an uh, architectural tour in the heart of Paris. And, you know, by the way, it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> the French, the American cover, <coughs> which I, <coughs> excuse me, which I designed. I mean, I didn't do the layout, but. I didn't want to have one specific angel on. I was afraid it would, if I put a Gothic angel, Renaissance angel, people think that would be what's inside. So that's why it has clouds. And then it has a script that, that is actually a typeset that comes from the 1850s. Uh, it was published by the Little Book, Book Room. I was very fortunate, it was a wonderful, wonderful publisher. And I want to tell you what her name is. Her first name is Angela. <laughs> so, I really saw this as like a sign from God, you know, how, how could I, how could I have a publisher whose name was, is Angel, essentially, you know, in Italian. And then uh, the French cover though, the French, they like everything a little bit more intellectual. So they wanted a, a, something, um, you know, they wanted one of the photos. So I chose this one. And then I, I wanted the red band because, you know, we have books in France when they first come out, very often they have a, a red band around them. And uh, so that's that's why it has that. But the letters are in gold, which is pretty. It's hard to see on here, but they are. And here are a couple of, of photos from from my book. This is in the uh, courtyard of the Sundial, uh, uh, court, excuse me, of the Sorbonne University. And these are quite unusual because they are gilded, <clears throat> <clears throat> and uh, it's the time of uh, of Louis the Fourteenth. And this is, of course, a very gilded, glorious age. In fact, uh, it's called the siècle d'or, the golden century. And you see, that here's the sundial in the background. You actually see um, the hours. And uh, they also even noted the dates of uh, the 21st of June, the, the, these dates in, in, in the month, sort of another way of timekeeping. And they, they dotted lines over the half hours. Uh, but the angels are quite interesting because um, they're intellectual angels, if you like. One of them has a compass, and and it's probably this is probably although she it looks masculine, it's probably meant to be a girl angel because usually the girl angels are fully dressed and uh, the, she's she's holding a compass measuring the earth, and this angel on the right is holding a tablet uh, meant to write note write down the notations. 
And not fully dressed. Exactly, naked to the naked torso. Yeah, this is typical. Um, this one is in the seventh. There's a beautiful fountain, which actually hardly is ever on. There's hardly any water that comes from this fountain, but it's beautiful. And there are, it's called the Fontaine des Quatre Saisons. It, that's the fountain of the four seasons. And this is a wonderful sculpture from the time of Louis XV, Edmé Bouchardon. And he's gotten the commission. And so he does four angels for each of the seasons. And this is the winter angel. So you can see he's decided to portray the angel as a, a young adolescent uh, holding onto his cape. You know, it's cold, it's in the winter. And funnily enough, very often with these, these depictions of angels, you know, you think, well, an angel, it's, it's got that religious connotation because it's a link between heaven and earth. But at the same time, you often find in European art, they weave in um, other more prosaic symbols, for instance, the zodiac. And so as it's a winter, that's why you have this goat, because that's Capricorn. That's the symbol for Capricorn, which is the uh, zodiac sign in uh, December and January, the winter months. So <laughs> there you go. Oh, right, so I'm kind of coming to the end of my presentation. Um, I thought I'd just get back to the portraits. And this is a portrait I did of uh, three sisters and it's in uh, pastel pencils. Um, and uh, by the way, this, the, the parents later used this as their Christmas card. And it, that, that, that was, I was very touched by that, you know, that they thought that it would be nicer to have the, the portrait than a kind of a classical photo uh, for their card. And um, I also want to mention, because I'm coming to the end of it, that um, I am uh, I, 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 previous to the to the uh, to the event. I think you, you might have had a chance to look at my website, and I have on the website my prices listed for the various types of portraits, um, really just for drawings. Although I do do oils as well, but on the website it's all about drawings, and I do. Uh, uh, basically um, songin and, and charcoal, three, three crayon pastel. And I do head and shoulders or half length with hands and so on. Okay. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think someone needs to mute, okay. Uh, but um, for Adrian's group, I'm offering a 10% discount. And also, if you commission a portrait where there's more than one person, I also uh, adjust the price accordingly. It's, it's a little bit less. Um, so that's, I wanted to say that. And then, oh yeah, <laughs> this is a more recent picture of me because sometimes I, I get worried that photos people see me are not really au uh, courant, you know, they're not really real. But we're having some beautiful weather right now in Paris. So I hope you can all come back to Paris soon. We all hope that COVID will be over soon. Uh, but in the meantime, the parks and gardens are open and I was in Luxembourg Garden on Sunday and a friend took this picture. Um, and then lastly, I think I have, yeah, here, here's the, the website and, uh, and my email address. And uh, so now I think I'm gonna stop the sharing of the screen and then I can, Thank sorry. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank okay. you, Rosemary. You're welcome. Fabulous presentation. Oh, thank wow. you. Wow, thank you. Thank so you. now we, are you prepared to take a Q&A? Oh yes, of course, yeah, sure. Okay, so for all of you people who have questions, um, either speak up or Patty, wanna take a look at some of the questions in the chat? Marilee McClintock had a question. Marilee, do you wanna ask your question? Uh, hi, that actually was uh, Nancy Kissick. Nancy, are you on? Yes, I am. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't get the link, so Marilee sent it to me so I could join you. My, my question had to do with uh, when you do portraits, do you paint directly from a photograph or do you project photograph onto canvas or how do you, how do, you do that? I, I paint from a photograph and I will show you uh, a work in progress. It's a dog. I also have a young man uh, in a chef, chef's hat. But um, what I do is people generally send me the photo, obviously digitally. 
and then I print it off. And then um, sometimes it's, you know, it's too small. So I'll say I'll go to a copy place and I have a larger one made. So I have a better reference, but also been, to tell you the truth, I draw and I have my computer next to me because I have a big uh, view of it on the screen. And this helps a lot. So it's a combination of working from the photo and uh, from it on the screen. Uh, but no, I don't project it onto the canvas. I, I don't do it like that, no. Thank you. You're welcome. Why is it that Nancy Kissick says Marilyn McClintock, and I see Marilyn and it doesn't say anything? <laughs> because, because I didn't get the link from you, even though I signed Are up. You, OK, you got the link from Marilyn. Yes. <laughs> okay. So that's why I have to join. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I love it. Um, Marilee, you made a comment though in your chat. You're you're there, right? Um, that you had a similar story because you live across the street from the duplicate archangel, Saint Michel. Yeah, unmute. You're muted. Uh, yes, Rosemary, I live across the street from Saint-Michel de Batignol, and the Archangel Michael there actually shines at night into my bedroom window. No, and that guilt, the know, angel sh shines, so you're on the sixth floor. I'm on the sixth floor, uh, <laughs> facing him. Right. And what I never knew until your book is that he is the the twin the carbon of Mont Saint Michel that only two were ever cast. That's correct. And even more, even more interesting for me is I have a Norwegian friend who I've been friends with since the early 1960s, who's a very strong angel believer. <laughs> and when your book came out, she loves Paris. She, we met in the U.S., but she's back living in Norway, and so I couldn't resist having uh, her book for, your book for her, uh, which, and I don't remember where you were signing at that point, uh, but uh -huh. you know, I have, she has your book <laughs> signed from Meta uh -huh. in uh, Norway, <laughs> so anyway, thank you. Okay, a pleasure. Great uh, this... story, great story, yeah. Yeah. Okay. May I ask a question? Yes. Um, I was wondering which of the medium are you feeling the most comfortable using? Um, it's hard to say really. I, I must say I really love many different mediums, um, except for lithography, for instance. I tried that. It's, it, this is not my thing. I think you get good results, but it's too mechanical and heavy and all of that. I love drawing. I've always loved drawing. So I love uh, working with pencil and songi. Pastel is also, I, I enjoy very, very much. And I love ink. Uh, I, yeah, I'm very partial to ink drawings. I don't tend to use ink, however, for portraits for some reason, but I do a lot of sketches with ink. And then oils, um, I have a lot of oils that I need to finish. Oils, I love working with oils. Uh, oils, it's really a noble, as a French will say, matière noble. It's a noble material, and it really is. Um, but it's, uh, I always find it's a lot longer, you know. I, there's so much, for me at least, is you can correct it, you change things, you, there's so much thought that goes into it. Um, and I have about a dozen paintings that I, I need to finish, but I'm concentrating on my my portraits right now. Are you yourself an artist? Is that what you're asking? I paint, yes. I see. And where are you from? I, I thought I did. Hey, Camarillo, you... California. It's uh, about uh, 50 miles north of uh, Los Angeles, along the coast. I know, but you're not American, are you? Where are you from? No, from Israel. Oh, I see. OK, I thought I detected an accent. <laughs> I see. Thank you. I can tell by Devorah's name. <laughs> I, I had to learn how to say Devorah. <laughs> Very good. Um, by the way, I, I see a question because uh, I, I opened up in the chat. Yeah, I didn't really, I should have mentioned all of the photos that you see are done from photos. They're all done from photos. Um, 
almost, except a couple of the oils maybe, but the drawings are all done from photos, yeah. And on my website, I, I mentioned that um, because really no one has time to pose anymore. And uh, so that's the most expedient uh, thing for everybody. It's also a good way to catch a pose too, because for instance, now in Paris, uh, sometimes, for instance, I have a client I went to see the other day. I'm doing a dog for her and also one of her daughters. And uh, I, I will take the photos. I'll take a lot of photos and then together we'll choose one. And, and even when people write uh, and send me photos, sometimes they'll send me a few and then we'll have a discussion about it. You know, what is the best one? Or sometimes they'll like a certain thing in one picture, but could I combine it with a different shirt or uh, little details like that, you know? So that's all possible. Um, by the way, I see this, you know, I, I don't, my, I can skip ahead. Judy Rook, while formulating your picks uh, to include all the Magnificent Angels of Paris. Oh, wait, I want to let's, check. But... Let's see if Judy will come on and ask her question. Okay, sure. I was going to say it too. <clears throat> uh, bonjour and bonsoir, everyone. Yes, um, I grew up knowing little to nothing about angels, but I will make a comment and a question. I've had this angel in my life for 40 years. Wow. I know nothing <laughs> about this angel, but I have to believe this angel brings me all kinds of good luck. Um, my question is because, uh, Rosemary, I have your book on order. And so I would like to know how long it took you to actually uh, secure all the information and in the pictures uh, related to, you know, the book to include all the beautiful angels and what, if anything, was your major challenge? Um, well, I think there are a couple of questions there, right? But, I think so. Uh, yeah. So you said, uh, how long did it take me? And um, from the moment I signed the contract until handing in the manuscript, it was one and a half years. So it's 18 months. And really though, I, I must say, uh, I wouldn't do it in such a compressed time again because I did the photography and the writing and the research. And uh, it was all labor of love. I mean, honestly, I was high while I was doing it, but I was also, I was so ex exhilarated by it. I was only sleeping five or six hours a night because I was also working at the same time I was touring. And so, Sometimes in the summer, I'd get up really early because, of course, the sun rises early and I could go to the Parc Montsouris and shoot an angel at, you know, 6.30, 7 o'clock and get a really beautiful light that way. Um, so, but yeah, what I say about the time, because by the end of it, when I handed it, I was burned out. So I, I think the challenge was, wasn't exactly a challenge, it was something I undertook. And I remember at the end, I remember my publisher saying, you know, Rosemary, you don't seem to take any time off. We could push this back a year if you like. And I said, yeah, I know, but now I've got the momentum. So I'd, I'd rather just keep going. So I did it. Um, so I just want to clarify, okay, because yeah. <laughs> I have a feeling it wasn't that you were high when you were doing it. It's just that doing it made you feel high. Is that right? <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> oh, did I say I was high? Yeah, I know. I meant I was high on doing it. Sorry. No, I know. Yeah, I'm just, just clarifying. <laughs> okay, thank you. No, no, well, don't, don't worry about that. No, I'm pretty, um, uh, what did you say? anti stupefiant No, I don't take anything. No, but it, it, it was so, it was just so exhilarating. It was just a really, really thrilling because this is when you do research and you find answers to, you know, questions and, and, and then hidden clues and so on. It's great. But then the question about the challenge. Yeah, there was, there were a couple of challenges there's one thing i'm still a little frustrated about these years later right but there are this is duo of angels and they're on top of the the chatelet theater the teatro du chatelet they're wonderful they're holding a um by the way do you mind if i just get up for a second and i could i could show you the picture just one second mm. <laughs> But I think you have to share. Um, how do I get back on camera? You're on camera. Oh, I You've never left. Oh, I didn't know that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you you left the camera to go pick to go get that, but you came back to your spot. Oh, because I guess so because I good. can't see my own picture. I think oh, the little pictures are hidden down here. Wait, how do I find the? 
You know when you see everybody's picture? Change, change your view. Change your view to gallery view. At the top right. Okay. Oh, because I had the chat thing on. Um, top right. We do see you though. Oh, view, view, view. Okay, I know, but gallery. Oh, wow. I see everybody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, can you see these two angels? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're great. And, and I was so blessed to, to get these two because it happened that I was um, walking along the sand. It was a really cold day. And, uh, you know, along the sand, we have the, the booksellers called the Bucanista. And I was looking at books and seeing if I could find, you know, any book about angels or something I hadn't learned about yet. And I was talking to this bookseller and she goes, well, enfin, you know, il y a les anges là-bas. And, and I looked up and on top of the theater are these two angels. And she said, and they're holding a paratonnerre. I was like, what's a paratonnerre? I had to figure it out. It means against the thunder, against the lightning, right? Uh -huh. So it's a lightning rod. Para against tonnerre, uh, lightning. Yeah. And you see how cute they are. Now there you see, it's a boy girl, a boy angel and a girl angel. How did you get that shot without a drone? Without, I'll tell you in a second, <laughs> I'll take it. Hold that thought, I will tell you. But when you asked what was a little challenging or frustrating for me, was I am still not 100% certain of the material it's made of. And I'm a real stickler for research. So what is that? Is that metal? Is it, um, is it, I don't, it's not bronze because at this point it would have turned green. Um, is it lead? And my guess lead. Was, it was lead. I wrote to everyone that you could at that theater to get information on that, you know? And nobody knew and they kept passing my mail around everything and they just didn't know they didn't care i think they were busy whatever they didn't want to and finally like yeah it's lead <laughs> but i didn't really believe it. i think they were just like let's get rid of this girl she's a pest right but anyway there you go now how did i get that picture i walked around paris with a ladder i have a lightweight ladder and i have a zoom lens and i would get up on my ladder and i get up to the top rung and i would take my picture and so um People did think I was crazy, and uh, I embraced that. I thought, you know, whatever, I didn't mind. By the way, I'm from a very large family. I'm from an Irish Catholic family of eight kids. And so, you know, you get a lot of teasing and abuse when you're from a big family. And I think it served me well, because I was like, well, I already know I'm crazy, it's okay. But I would go around with that letter, yeah. I remember one time when I was doing, here's another one up really high, and that is, um, and, and there I was really, really fortunate. This is uh, the Place Vendôme. And you see there's Napoleon on top of the Place Vendôme. Now this one, strictly speaking, is not an angel. It's a, it's a winged victory, but I put it in the book because I wanted to explain that not everything that's winged is an angel, but she sure looks like an angel. But in fact, angels, their iconography came from mythical figures. And it was under Constantine in 325 that he kind of morphed um, figures that were gods or goddesses and they were winged. Like when you think when you go to the Louvre, you see the winged victory? That's not an angel, is it? It's a mythological figure and it's actually called Nike and it's got the wings. And uh, the halo uh, was actually a laurel wreath. You know, sometimes they'd have a laurel wreath on their head or they'd be holding it. And so they're like, oh, okay, well, no, actually we'll call that the aura. We'll call that the, the halo. So it's interesting that, you know, that's, that's how things happen in terms of symbology. Because when you read about angels in the Bible, they don't necessarily speak about their wings. Um, anyway, so here's Napoleon. But the lucky thing was, I really wanted to get this picture. And even on my ladder, which I did try at the Place Vendôme, I couldn't get the picture I wanted. So I went to a jewelry shop that had offices on an upper floor. And I asked if I could take the picture from their window and they said, yes. Wow. wow. So I met a lot of nice people that way too. <laughs> Thank you so much now for taking the time to answer. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. And so now, now, Rosemary, all you need is a drone. 
Yeah, that would be too easy though, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was really, really fun going around. Oh, with the other last one that's high up that I want to show you uh, is at the uh, Saint Chapelle. So the Saint Chapelle is in the shadow of the courthouse, the central courthouse in France, in Paris. You see, can you see it well? That's the courthouse uh, with the beautiful gates, and there you see on the side the chapel. And so really the chapel, where the courthouse is, it was a, a palace of the king, of um, various kings. And he wanted to have an entrance so that he could walk from the upper floor into the chapel. So that's why it was attached to the palace. In any case, the, the chapel, the Saint Chapelle, means holy chapel, it's got this gorgeous steeple. And it has all these angel musicians on it because I had to shoot them. And I had to go, oh, the, oh, this was a challenge, but you know, it wasn't hard. It was just really fun to try to figure out, okay, what direction does it face? Which, what is the best time of day to go to, to, to shoot it? You know, some angels, you know, if they're in the Eastern part of Paris or they're getting Eastern exposure from uh, sunrise, you know, you, you go early in the morning. Otherwise you go at the end of the day, if, it's, if you get a, to get a beautiful glow of sunset. In any case, these are really up high. So I had my ladder. I actually took it, I, I, I mean, I took it into the courtyard. I took it into the courtyard. I couldn't believe the security didn't stop me. I think I had such an attitude of like, oh, this is what I'm meant to do. You know, I belong here. I'm the angels expert. I'm just here to shoot these angels. I guess I thought as a reporter, I don't know what they thought. They didn't ask me. But I would also take pictures from the opposite side of the street. So one day, I'm up on the ladder taking the pictures and I was wearing a black trench coat. So <laughs> this old man comes up to me, you know, I get down to the ladder and he says to me, are you a spy? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. I said, I'm, I'm an expert on angels. That's <laughs> So if you look up, you'll see those angels. <laughs> That's a <good> story. <laughs> oh, one last story about the angels, though. That's really kind of I thought so much was so much fun and really stupefying to me was that uh, I'd go to certain areas and it was just like what um, Adrian said. There was an angel right nearby on the corner of the Rue de Saint Ange and the Rue de Bretagne, right near her, and she hadn't noticed it. And they are holding, uh, because the Rue de Bretagne, that means the Rue is Brittany Street, they're holding the, the, the Côte yeah. of Brittany and for Saint-Ange, which is a province of France. And uh, so- That's my corner. There you go, there, <laughs> there's a close-up. In my book, I always have an overall shot and then I have a close-up of it. So, the biggest, the largest angel, the biggest angel in Paris spans three stories of a building. And it's on the Rue de Turbigol. And I went and I shot it a few times. Um, oh yeah, in fact, they used it for the frontispiece. Wait, I should show you that picture because that was, that's a, I, I like this picture. Um, although I have um, closer up pictures. And by the way, this angel is sometimes featured in movies. It's in a great movie by Agnes Varda, V-A-R-D-A. Mm -hmm. uh, great movie called, uh, I think it's called De Cinq à Sept, Five to Seven. Um, and it's about two hours in the life of this young woman. And then uh, anyway. Well, you know what Cinq à Sept is, right? Yeah. Well, you yeah. can explain, Agent. Yeah. No, I think you should explain it. <laughs> okay, so it's got a bit of a saucy undertone. Um, five to seven, you know, in the working hours in France can be sort of nine to seven or nine to six or whatever, but uh, there's a gray area of five to seven when many men would go to see their mistress before they would go home. So uh, the whole idea is he was going to see his girlfriend, but in the movie, the girlfriend is actually quite ill and she spends a couple of hours on her own, but Agnes Varda takes this opportunity to kind of do these, this amazing tour of Paris and it's in the 60s. So when you see this movie, you're really you know, going back in time. But she does cover this angel. Uh, I can't oh remember. yeah, I, yeah, I know that. 
And you see how it spans three stories. Yeah. That's not far from me either. <laughs> no, it's not far from you either. So I, I went there a few times to shoot it. By the way, sometimes I shoot, you know, three or four times because I wasn't, I wanted to get different views, um, different angles, different times of day and so on. So that was the overall shoot shot. But I cannot tell you how often people who lived in the neighborhood on that street had never noticed the angel. I was amazed by that. But I guess that's how it is. You know, you have to look up. Persians never look up. Not, not, no, not, 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 not always. So, uh, in fact, the original subtitle of my book, I wanted to be called "The Angels of Paris Looking Up in the World's Most Beautiful City." Uh, however, uh, my book um, so it was published by a Little Book Room and distributed by Random House. And I, this is my first and only book. I'm working on something else, but the the distribution is is, is Random House, and Random House said no. Uh, that it should be, um, it has a subtitle that has key words in it, like architecture, history, Paris, you know? So that's why the subtitle couldn't be looking up in the world's most beautiful city. There's not enough to hang on. It, it's gotta be called architectural, you know? So you got the architectural tour and history. So that's why it's called that. And then also I had wanted the book to be grouped. Uh, I wanted it to be done in a chronological way. So you could see, how the depictions of angels change from the Middle angel, Ages to the Baroque, you know, Renaissance, uh, then going through Art Nouveau, Art Deco, you know, and so on. And they said, no, uh, it should be by Andy Small. I said, okay. I thought that was strange, but all right. And you know what? They were absolutely right because the first thing people well, do. That, that way you can follow it. Yeah, no, the first thing people do when they get the book, they say, oh, you know, yeah, I, I live in the, in the third. What angels are in the third? So it's normal, you know, they, they were quite right about that. Uh, yeah, so I hope I haven't digressed too much. I hope I answered the question was, yeah, the challenge. Yeah, sometimes I was, or another frustration was not knowing who was the sculptor of an angel because I love giving the credit. I love being able to say yeah. so-and-so sculpted this and this is his story. I like telling a little of the story about the artist. Some of these stories are really interesting, by the way. Like the, when we talked about the one at Batignol, I don't know if you, re, you recall, but in the book I say that, that sculptor, Fremier, who's one of the greatest sculptors of France, he, he did that gilded statue of Joan of Arc. You know the one outside of the Tuileries Gardens? She's on a horse. It's fabulous. You can't miss it. Oh, yeah. Great, great statue. Oh, he also did a very uh, frisky statue that's in the Lou, uh, the Orsay Museum. It's called... <laughs> It's this lounging new, naked woman and she's in this state of, it looks like ecstasy, okay? It looks kind of orgasmic, but no, he calls it woman bitten by a snake, all right? <laughs> it is orgasmic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it was, Rosemary, uh, that, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, but he has a snake, you know, biting her, right? But, but you know, you get the, yeah. you, you get the metaphor here. So they wanted to, of course, you know, ban him. For, I don't know. It was very controversial. Uh, but here's the thing about this man. So he was a specialist also in animals, and he he did a, he did also some sculptures in America. I mean, he did a lot of beautiful work. But he went through a depression. He went through a depression at one point, and uh, after the Franco-Prussian War in the 1870s, he thought, you know, what I'm doing is frivolous. This makes no sense. Why am I a sculptor? You know, what's the meaning of life? I mean, he started asking all these heavy existential questions and uh, he kind of retired to the countryside and he, he really went through a very dark period, um, you know, obviously verging on suicide, uh, but he got out of it. Thank God he got out of it and he went on and he kept creating. But I, I, you know, it's kind of a sad story, but it's a great story because there's a joy at the end of it. I mean, he actually, he, he rode the wave, he got out of it. And he went on to do, after that, he did that fabulous sculpture of St. Michael the Archangel. And when I, when I was photographing that, I didn't know his story at the time. I thought, this guy is amazing. He's got such a sense of humor because if you look at that statue of Michael on, the, he's crushing a reptile. Okay, he's like kind of crushing some kind of lizard. Actually, that's what he's crushing a lizard. And he's, he's got this swaggering pose and uh, he's dressed in Renaissance armor. 
And, and I thought this, this statue is actually quite hilarious. I mean, if you look at it, it's very funny. This, this guy, he's brilliant. And sure enough, you know, when I read about his lady with the snake, I'm like, wow, this is, no kidding. And, and that's the statue that he did that I'm talking about that, that she just asked me the question about before. And one is, this one is also, there's a, the, there, there was cast a couple of times. This is a smaller version of the one that is at Mont Saint-Michel. So, um, and, and Michael, of course, is a very important angel in France. Michael apparently had an apparition in, his, in the sixth century to mariners, to sailors uh, in Saint-Michel. Uh, well, that's why they called the Mont Saint-Michel. Right? They named after and they put the abbey there and so on. But uh, most, I tried actually, I had to try not to put too many depictions of uh, Michael in, in, in the book because I didn't want to be drowning in Michael. But that's why, for instance, the Place Saint-Michel, that's St. Michael the Archangel as well. You know? So anyway, uh, where is the best place to get the book? Amazon. To tell you the truth, right now it's Amazon, and and I'm sorry. In a way, I'm sorry to say that I love supporting bookstores, but I can never be sure if it's in stock. And in Paris, I I've been in many many different bookstores, and I especially wanted Shakespeare to keep it all the time in stock because I was touring, and I could bring clients into the store to buy the book. And uh, they'd be, oh, no, we just get it Christmas time. Oh, no, we have some, but we're out of it. No, 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 no. And so, you know, it was in Galerie Lafayette. It was in Beaumarche. It was in the Muse Museum of Decorative Arts in the bookstore. It was um, in Galignani. Uh, it, it was just in so many places, but it, it, it couldn't be reliable, whereas, you know, Amazon it is. And uh, it's going to come out in, as an ebook soon this year definitely this year, because I think it would be handy because a lot of people, you know, like to use their tablets. And it's also good for tourists because if you're visiting a certain neighborhood, you can look at something and learn something. And, you know, it's, uh, could be fun facts, you know, fun, interesting it's things. It's in my house. Oh, thank you, James. It's in my house, <laughs> it's in my house too, on my, on my crazy bookshelf you see behind me, for right. sure. Yeah. Um, so, so we kind of got off the subject of portraits, however. Yeah, but maybe we should look at the chat box again. I don't know where there are other questions. So uh, Susan Ward says she thinks that the that I'm back on angels, not, maybe not lead, but zinc. The Chatelet, the Chatelet. Yeah, that's a good guess too. Yeah, I I I I don't think I'll ever know unless I get to climb up on top of that theater <laughs> and you know knock it you know, do a test. I, I don't know how to know, but what I learned a lot about uh, about so many things like like lightning rods. I mean, we all talk about lightning rods, we know about Benjamin Franklin and, and so on, but, but how it works is that you just have to have <clears throat> some sort of metal conductor. So it could be zinc, it could be lead, could be any type of metal. Uh, that's why Franklin used a key. And so that's gonna draw the energy from the lightning. And then we don't see it, obviously, on that decorative lightning rod or lightning rod apparatus, if you like. It's very beautiful on top of with the little angels and the, the mask, the, the theatrical mask. But there is a, a wire, some, some sort of a line that's going to be descending through the lightning rod and going along the top of the building and all the way down the side to the ground mm -hmm. so that that electrical energy, which could be negative, obviously, if you're hit by it, will be ground, literally grounded. So, um, Have you thought well, about doing portraits of your angels? <laughs> not, not, ex not really, you know, uh, a lot of people have asked me that. Well, maybe I'll do drawings. I have thought of doing ink drawings. I have thought of doing a series of sayings about angels. I, I don't know exactly how to connect, or maybe doing ink drawings with the sayings around it, like, you know, there's so many, for instance, the politicians are always using that term about, it came from Lincoln, uh, about uh, our better angels, right? You know, we're talking about making the right decision, turning to our better angels. But there's also things like, uh, and I, I would think about this actually, when I, sometimes when I'd launch a project and I had no idea what I was doing, you know, fools, <laughs> fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Yeah, right. That's a great one too. <laughs> and then there's um, 
Uh, I wish I had the list handy because I did make a list. Uh, friends are kisses sent to us by angels. I like that. Uh, too. That's a nice one. Yeah, that's and, a nice one. Yeah, and then um, uh, I have to think. Oh, th there's one um, that's written on um, the staircase of the Shakespeare uh, bookstore. Um, and it says, it's something about being welcoming to strangers, mm -hmm. so, something for they may be an angel in disguise. Right. Uh -huh. and, and it's true because sometimes angels, if you do believe in angels, which obviously I do, angels sometimes do take human form. Sometimes you can be in an extreme situation and you, you, you pray. And, and, and suddenly somebody will just materialize. This has happened to me. I'm sure. that, that's happened to me too. They materialize. Yes. yes. <clears throat> and then they disappear. Yes. It's, ha it's ha weirdly happened to me. Yes. And, it, and they, they just disappear into thin air. Someone shows up when you need, you need something. They're there. They, they give you the direction you need and then they're gone. Yeah. And they turn around. They, they, yeah. They've disappeared. Um, so that made me think of something else about the angels, but, uh, oh, I know, I want to recommend a book. Uh, if anybody is interested in angels and wants, let's say proof or a statistical or some sort of information on it. And this is a book I read years ago, way before I had the idea of, of doing my book. And it's written by a journalist, a French, actually he's originally uh, Serbian, I believe, maybe Serbian French. And it's called, uh, an inquiry into the existence of guardian angels. And this journalist who was working for, I uh, think, Le Parisien, one of the French newspapers, he's in California, he's driving along a freeway, and suddenly a voice, suddenly, so he, a voice, or for some reason, he's sort of told, so to speak, it could be, how do you call that, the transmission, thought transmission, that he should duck down. He's in the passenger seat of the car. He ducks down and a bullet goes through the windshield. You know, there was some sniper. He was almost killed. And he just can't, he can't get over this. He's shocked. And he, um, he's an atheist. He has no religion whatsoever. He doesn't believe in angels. But then he talks to his reporter friends and he says, you know, this, this weird thing happened to me. And they, and they said, oh, it's your guardian angel. He goes, I don't believe in guardian angels. There are no guardian angels. I said, well, you know, they tell similar stories. So he decides, because he's an investigative reporter, to do an investigation into angels. And uh, because he's so disbelieving, they start showing up all the time. Just when it's like, oh, no, a, tr a big truck will go by and it's the angels moving company. Or, you know, uh, <laughs> he, he won't be able to get on a plane for some reason. And then for some reason, he's directed to learn something about something to do with angels. And then, and then he really starts to believe in angels and he, in his book, which is quite thick. In fact, if I get, I can get up and get my copy of it, I'll, I'll show you the cover. Um, he, uh, he then also, I think he interviews or he reads about Raymond Moody who writes about the after death experience, uh, sorry, near death experience. Um, but uh, he even finds some living saints. Um, he, he does this whole investigate, Padre Pio, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, what, after you finish reading, I mean, you believe or you don't believe, I'm not here to proselytize. I'm just saying that there has been a book published uh, to, to document this uh, idea. Okay, so I just want to go back to your portraits for a minute. Yes, thank you. Yes, please, let's do that. Um, oh, yes, I, I mean, want to show you what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, show us what you're doing and yeah. uh, talk to us about, you know, people who can have their portraits done. Yeah, because it's so pleasure. wonderful to have a, a have the you know, not just a photo but the art. Oh yeah, I, I mean, it's course, such a difference. Yeah, of course I agree with you, yeah, but you I mean, know. I do agree, and I want to say that I'm also, frankly, sometimes amazed by the number of commissions I do get, for instance, of children or other people, but especially of children, because what do people do all day long? They're taking pictures with their iPhone of their kids. Oh, look, he just, you know, he did this funny thing or he smiled in a different way or, or he did this or he's playing with the dog and so on. So they've got all these photos, but they still want a, a portrait that's drawn. 
So why is that? I think there are a couple of reasons. One is that when we love somebody, we can never get enough of the face of our beloved. You know, I, I just think that's true. So very often now these iPhone photos, people don't print them off. Sometimes people still do studio, studio pictures. They'll, they'll still get a, you know, a proper photo done somewhere, but very often they don't. But there's something about art, which is when it's done by hand, uh, it's not digital. There's this there's an added element, and then they will frame it and mat it, and then it also becomes an heirloom. You know, it's mm -hmm. something that's given down mm -hmm. and through the generations. So there's there's that appeal. I think that's part of it. Right. Um, uh, so on Lois, I you know what? I actually had something else I was going to show. Remember the the portrait of the boy, and then I moved it, and now I have to look through my stuff. So I'm almost. I don't want to say embarrassed, but I'm going to show you something. Well, let's see your top. Let's see your doggy. My dog, yeah, but it's really in the early stages. But in answer to the question about do I project the drawing? No, you'll you, when you see this, you'll you'll you sort of know. I think that it, it's not. Um, but wait, let me find the photo, uh, which I did have handy, so that you, you'll see how I. Oh, that's right in back. I I am organized actually. Um, so this is. Um, this dog, and by the way, they love the dog. This is the second picture I'm doing of the dog because I did one and the dog was out of doors. They live in Versailles and the dog was in the park. And then the, the kid's like, yeah, mom, but we want one where he's indoors, you know, and he's lounging on one of the chairs and the sofa. And she's like, okay, you know, so we do a different one. And uh, should I be doing full screen or am I full screen? I don't know. You're good. Okay. You're good. So here's the picture. Here's the photo. Oh, Doxy. Um, yeah, but I don't know if it's a dachshund. It's got long legs. Oh, Are dachshunds oh. Like the ground? oh, maybe not. Yeah, maybe not. It's another type of that kind of a dog. But, um, it's a little bit of a challenge, I'll tell you, when doing dogs that are, are black like this, but it's a good challenge. And, um, mm -hmm. so, so that's was, the photo. That's, that's the, the photo. photo. So it's, it's really not finished. And I'm doing it in the three crayon, uh, three, three pencil. Uh, style, and um, I'm I'm not I'm not actually Hi. certain about the chair. How I'm gonna Rosemary, turn the canvas just a little bit so we can see it better. I know, I know. I'll hold it in front. I'll hold it in front, but only okay. very briefly because it's really not done. <laughs> but I've sketched in the chair, and uh, here's Yuki. Okay, and oh sweet, he's not not quite done, but um, I want. Cute. Yeah, if I could see the chair, I, it's it's sketched in. I, I know the chair needs to be there. Um, I'm not certain. You know, pictures take on life of them, their own. And as you're drawing, suddenly it becomes clear, you know. Uh, so will I do cross hatching with a, with a darker color or will I use the songin? I'm not certain yet. Uh, I, I know it needs a bit of emphasis in some way to set him off, but um, I love the pose. I mean, I really, I like, and he's a fun dog. Curiously, the dog's name is Yuki, and uh, it's a black dog, but Yuki means snow in, in Japanese. So I don't know why the kids named Yuki, but they did. Um, yeah, I could show you also one that, that is pretty much finished, uh, this boy with the chef's hat, and I moved stuff around, but I, I will find it. Do you mind if I get up for a minute and that way I could also get the book to show you? Would you like me sure. to read it? Okay. Sure. Be right back. We're hey, we're loose. Okay. <laughs> I just didn't know about we're the we're here to we're here to get have a good time and to learn things. Okay, I just wish I had a glass of wine. Be right back. Everybody agree? <laughs> I wish I had a glass of wine. It's a little early. Well, for go me, get but... one. Yeah, go get it. It's a little go early. Go get for one. Me. What time is it there? <laughs> Uh, it's still 1.40 here. Oh. I'm in, I'm in Philadelphia. Yeah, we miss little, you, Eileen. It's a little early. Oh, I miss you guys, too. You have no idea. Yeah. I know. It's so, this is just, you know, this is getting old. <laughs> is everybody so agree? Old. Everybody's going, yeah. yeah, I had enough. Thank you. How many, okay, while we're on break, how many people have had their vaccinations? I have. All right. Good showing. Thursday. Uh, 
I no, have. Not me, not yet. <laughs> How about you, Adrian? She's no. too young. Adrian's no. too young. My doctor yeah. said I can do it on Thursday, and I said, but I can't because I'm on a train to Nice. So, um, you know, try. it's just called trying to fit it in. <laughs> it's not working. Yeah. Yeah. Busy. We're bu busy life. Just Very in the meantime, wear a double mask. You know what? I, I don't uh, live with much fear, so I do what I have to do, but I don't worry about it too much. And so far, I've been health. It's the healthiest year I've ever had. I don't know about you guys, but no colds, no flu, no nothing. Because you wore a mask. Because That's you wore right. Yeah, because everybody did. Right. Right? Yeah, and I haven't, we haven't seen hardly anybody. Like, you know, no contact. But hopefully, this is going to let up soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, we'll all be free. You guys will be free to come back to France. Soon, yeah, we, soon. We hope so. We hope so. Yeah. But as I said, I'm going to have to figure out a way to do these, uh, the après-midi live and on Zoom somehow, because it's been too much fun, you know? Yeah, yeah I hope you keep doing that uh, even after the the COVID crisis has relented. Uh, these are very, very interesting. Well, I hope we're going to be able to do them too. I'm just not sure. I totally you know? agree. We, okay, we take, it looks like Rosemary's, Rosemary's, we've taken a bit of a break and had some conversation while you were gone. <laughs> well, right, I, I hear you talking about hoping everybody can come back to Paris and how. Yeah. Um, well, see, everybody's got to come look at all your angels yes. and come have a portrait done. Come have a portrait done, please do. Well, but they could send you, you they could send you a photo. You did mine yes. from a photo. You can send a photo online. And, um, oh, I also wanted to mention, um, oh, I, I, I did show the photo and, and then how I draw it and so on. Um, but what happens after that is I put it in a French drawing folder like this. Okay. So this is a nice sturdy folder. It's very nice. Mel things, yeah. The, the more, I, so they come in different colors. Sometimes a classical one really is this green and black one. And um, then you, you have it. And also, I um, the portrait, of course, they're on paper and they are then um, treated with a fixative so that they won't smudge. and. On top of it, I put on uh, tracing paper. Well, I'll just show you a small piece of tracing paper. Like but tracing paper. So it's, it's sort of wrapped in tracing paper, and then it's put in the folder, and then it's shipped. And so the cost that you'll see on the site, it includes all of all of the shipping and the wrapping and the, the handling and all of that. Um, so. Yeah, but as I say on the site, uh, people will first send me a photo, and then I like to set up a call, a Zoom call, or a phone conversation, or WhatsApp, or whatever you like. I also have, by the way, fixed line, and I can call another fixed line for free. We just have to take into account, of course, the six-hour time difference. Um, and so, say I, I get a picture, and uh, sometimes, by the way, people send me things in black and white, but I'll show you something in color that I was given. This is a young man, um, Brian. And he, uh, as you can see, he was training to be a, a chef. And now he, well, he had a job at a restaurant because the restaurants are closed right now. And they had taken this picture of him when um, he had gotten his talk, his cap, and uh, very proud of that. So that's how she wanted his portrait done. She has three children. And um, I was like, fine, I think that's a great idea. And so then we'll have a discussion. Do they want it in pastel uh, or sanguine or could be charcoal? Uh, so we decided it would be in three colors, uh, the technique I mentioned before. So I'm going to show you uh, what it is. And I also suggest different shades of paper. Sometimes the client will say, whatever you think is best. 
And oh, wait, Rosemary, so you said mine is mine is in three colors. It is. Yeah. And yours is on a light paper. It's on a cream colored paper. And the reason for that, of course, it helps the colors to pop. Now, this one is on a, a slightly it's deeper. It's really beautiful. This is on a, a oh, yeah. deeper colored paper. Oh, very nice. Beautiful. Thank you. And so you see uh, that I'm using white chalk. Well, white chalk essentially means pastel. And then the dark pencil I told you about, the Pierre Noir and the sanguine, the red chalk. And really with those three colors, I think it, it gives a, a beautiful effect. Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, it's wonderful. He looks so sweet. Yeah. Yeah, he is. He's a nice guy. I, I love Brian, actually. Yeah, I like him. I did him 10 years before that. And uh, his mother had called recently and said, you know, the kids are grown up and uh, I'd like you to do them again. Oh, I wanted to just maybe just talk a little bit about my materials, just show you what I use. Uh, because you may not be familiar with these things. Um, I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't before I came to Paris because it's really here that I, I did really most of my artistic education. Um, I put everything out. Oh, well, let me see. Um, this is actually a rather old fashioned appliance. You, maybe you can find it in the States, but artists would put the red chalk in one end and the charcoal in the other end. And so it's quite handy, really. It's, it's, these are really wonderful. And then you just sort of unscrew it to put in a new, uh, we call it batonet, a new stick if you need it. But also use them in pencil form like this. And uh, I use. Um, Where do you shop for your supplies? Uh, well, there, there are a few different places I go to, but one of my favorites is Sennelier. Sennelier is one of the oldest art stores. It, it goes back to 1869, I believe. It's on the Quai Voltaire in mm -hmm. the sixth. And it's a dream to go to um, because the, uh, I love going there for their paper, in particular, they have a beautiful, beautiful section of paper. They have also their own brands of paints and so on, and pastels. I'm not as keen as on the, those brands. I like Schmincke. It's a German uh, brand for the pastels. It's the best, to my mind, the best quality. Watercolors, I think uh, Windsor & Newton is the best. Um, and brushes, I, I think Raphael is the best. But anyway, I love Sennelier there. I was, always, I was there the other day. The only thing I'll say about Sennelier is it's a small store. I am very, very COVID cautious. And, uh, you know, even though they say, oh, we, we shouldn't have, we don't have more than four people in the store, sometimes they do. And so I've started going there only really at a certain hour when I'm sure there's hardly anybody there. Or I go to another wonderful place called La Vrute. And La Vrute is in one of those old passageways, which is gorgeous, in the second arrondissement. And there's a really big, spacious store, and they have great things. Each store has their own personality and their own products. I mean, they often have all, all have the same, but, but there are variations. There are always different things. One might have Italian paper, Fabriano, the other won't. The other will have Japanese paper. You know, there's, there's certain articles you can only get in certain places. So um, the Pierre Noir is this. This is this dark pencil, which, which I really adore. Uh, it, it just gets such a, it, you get a more vibrant black with it. And then I have these other tools, which might seem peculiar, but the best way to sharpen a pencil is actually with a uh, box cutter because you oh. get the, the finest point. You have to learn, it's an acquired art, but if you do, you'll get a really, really fine point. And when you're doing portraits, you, know, you want to be able to get all the little details of the pupil of the eye or you know the ears and so on. And then after you sharpen it with your cutter, um, there's nothing better than sandpaper you use sandpaper, uh, you rub it against the sandpaper, and that makes it even, even finer. So, um, so those are my tools pretty much, um, other than of course my pastels, I could show you my pastels as well. But uh, like I was saying, the, pa the paper choice is important and then also the size of the portrait. Um, very often what I, I do is an A3, it's the equivalent of an A3, so that's what the dog is. And 
of course, very often, this one, I'm, un, un, uncharacteristically, it's horizontal, but very often, of course, it's vertical. But because uh, Yuki is lounging there on that, uh, Louis the did, did you just call it, though, with the size, the proportion? The, can I just, sorry, call it? What did you say? Yeah, the proportion, the proportion of the, the size of the drawing. Yeah, it's the about, well, I, I do list that all. I think it's like uh, 20, oh, see, I think in center, I can tell you. Actually, I just look on the pen. Excuse me, I just have to plug in my computer because the battery's going on. One second, please. Break time. <laughs> Adrian, I have a question for her when you get when she comes back and I and you can find a place for me to jump in. Okay. Well you can jump in when she gets back. Okay. For sure. We've got we've got nine more minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Eileen has a question for you, Rosemary. Yes. First of all, you look amazing and I'm oh, so hey, happy oh. to see Hi. I didn't see you. <laughs> so happy to see you. Thank um, you. And, you, know, you have met, I think, all of my nieces when they came to Paris to, to see me. And yeah. they are all young mothers now. And I oh. am always sending their children books. And I choose the books according to how beautifully they're illustrated. So I am extremely happy to uh, see that you're doing a children's book and I must know the minute that it's published. I don't even care if it's in French. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they will love that because they, they, these little children all know about the Eiffel Tower because their mothers were there and they always talk about it. Oh, great. Yeah, well, there's, there's actually gonna be a lot of other monuments because you can imagine they're flying through the air and they're gonna have a oh, lot I love of adventures. It. They're gonna go by the Opera House as well. So, oh my god. Yeah, and their angels on the opera house are gonna to come to life. I mean, there's all this stuff going on. So but thanks, um, thanks for saying that because it really encourages me to to make it happen, you know. Oh, oh yes, it must have, and I must have like one of the first copies. Okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's really wonderful that you are marrying the, you know all of your talents. Yes. Because yeah, I mean, because with angels it was the photography and the art history and the writing. And now you're going to be able to incorporate your art. Yeah, so sure. It's, it's right. really great. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, excuse me, I looked for that book and I, I forgot I lent it to somebody. And <laughs> the one on the inquiry into the, but that's the title, the inquiry into the existence of guardian angels. And I think the man's name is Janovic or something like that. Uh -huh. So um, otherwise I was going to say something else. Oh, about the portraits, right? So I do children, adults, and I do animals as well. I did show you that dog, but I've done cats, I've done rabbits, I've done birds, I, I'm, <laughs> uh, any kind of animal. I enjoy doing animals as well. And you did cows, we know you did cows. We Cow. saw the cow. Yes, that's right, cows, and I've done donkeys as well. Yeah, all kinds of animals. Uh, well, we, you know, we only have, we have seven minutes left. Yeah. This, the, this has gone very quickly. Anybody have any other questions? I do. I have a question about Songin. Um, okay. And I wanted to know, did it draw, go out of favor or was it used only in a particular way? And what drew you to it? Nancy, um, we can't see you. Yeah, I can't. I, um, we'll look. Oh, this is Nancy Kulitsa? It's Nancy. Yeah, it's Nancy. No. Yeah, Nancy Kulitsa. Yeah. Nancy Kulitsa. yeah. I'm, it I'm says narrowly, narrowly, but it's Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so I, it's I don't think I have a video. Oh, I see. All right. Um, I don't know if it ever really went out of favor. I mean, I'm not the only one using it, but do you mean you, you haven't seen pictures done with Sanguine before? Maybe it's not, it's more of a European thing. Yes, I don't, well, I live here, but I don't, it's not something that I see often. It's, it's not, I, I, I could use the word popular, but I don't know if that's the correct word, but it's not something that is used often that from my experience, and I spend a lot of time in museums and galleries. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, in museums, um, drawings aren't, 
always on display because they're oh, yeah. fragile. So if you go to an exhibition of drawings- Is that why? Is that why they're- yeah, That's right. Because they're yeah. so fragile? That's right. Yeah, so you'll notice if you ever go to a special exhibition of, of drawings, um, let me think of something, uh, uh, well, I haven't seen anything in a year, obviously, like everybody else, but uh, uh, when you go to an exhibition, you know, and, and you see drawings, say there was one of Michelangelo a number of years ago, right, or whoever, they're always in a subdued, in a dark room with subdued light mm -hmm. because they have to be protected. Um, now, I mean, there's easier ways of protecting them today because we have glass that will protect UV. them. Yeah, you like glass. UV plexi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, now I, I suppose I haven't seen a lot of, there is a great, um, to, my, to my mind, a great contemporary artist named Ernst Pignon Ernst, and I think he uses sanguine sometimes. There are some people who draw with sanguine. I, it's true there's a lot of graphic pencil used today. That's right. But um, yeah, graphic pencil, but not sanguine. Mm, not sanguine. Uh, I, I guess I use it a lot because of my background, my training in learning the techniques of the masters and uh, with that radical professor I mentioned. Uh, yes. And I actually really like sanguine. I think sanguine is, is a beautiful um, medium. And the, the reason why it was very popular during the Renaissance in particular, and then later in, in France, is that, of course, that word comes from sang, meaning blood. So it's, it's got that reddish color. So the idea is that it recalls the flesh tones. And uh -huh. so uh -huh. for okay. many people that love using sanguine, it's that it's a little less harsh than using like charcoal, for instance. Although charcoal is not necessarily harsh. I mean, it's, it's not necessarily, there's nothing wrong with charcoal. Same thing with like the, the other black pencil I use. But there is something very beautiful, I think, about some people. But it's but it's black, you know. It, it's black. black. Just is going to be dominant anyhow. So um, yeah. Although when I've done um, for some reason when I've done Asian children, uh, and the, I have some drawings on my site of Asian kids, I have used uh, piano noir, black chalk, or um, graphite. For some reason, it seems to instinctively lend. Their look lends to that material. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but I think as far as also subliminally, I'm thinking of black ink, of the ink drawings and calligraphy. I think there's that that somehow connects. And the fact that their hair is very, very black. I don't yes. know. But uh, yeah, I suppose that's true. I hadn't thought about how, how often it's used today. I do know other artists, portrait artists that use it. That's, that's for sure. I, I think if you would, yeah, well, yeah. I guess I don't have a, a very set answer to that question. I, I personally love using it. Yeah, <laughs> very nicely also. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. So we're down to like okay. less than two minutes and uh, Rosemary, is there anything, any closing you'd like to, anything you'd like to say before we uh, head up, you know, shut um, down? Well. Just in terms of the portraits, um, anything. Oh, okay, sure. But just to finish with the portraits, um, please take a take a look at the website. If you have any questions whatsoever, don't hesitate to ask. Even if you don't want to order a portrait, or if you're thinking of ordering one, or if you have a question about anything, just I, I'd love to hear from you. That would be a lot of fun. Um, and uh, uh, I, I didn't mention the time delay. I, I need usually about a week uh, for the drawing because I'm often working on a couple of things at once. And uh, also I like to reflect. So I don't, I might spend a couple of hours here and three hours there and so on. So it might take a full week, but I need that time. And then you have to allow about a week for it to be, to, for it to arrive because I use this uh, system called Colissimo. They say five to seven days. Sometimes I'm finding the post is longer than that but also people have their own system and they have a FedEx number, I can send it that way. So that's, I just want to talk about the practical end of that. Um, but that's, that's uh, what else to say? I don't know. Thank you so much for coming and for asking. I want to, and thank you. Thank you, Rosemary, so much. So everybody, if we just, we <laughs> <Bye. laughs> <Thank you. laughs> 
And Andrea, this has just been delightful. I cannot thank you enough. Uh, I thank you for my portrait. I love my portrait. Thank you to everyone who participated. Uh, this will be, it's been recorded, so you can watch it again. You can send it to your friends. I'll be writing about it in tomorrow's Nouvellette. So, and we'll see you a month from now. So thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful Thanks, rest Mary. of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you, Rosemary. Au revoir.